Okay, welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Corrado. I am the convener of uh, Lean Agile Delivery and Coaching Network and Digital Transformation in London, the three communities, actually based in London, but uh, with this virtual meetup uh, across uh, all over the world, I would say. Uh, you know, one of our, uh, uh, let me say, breaking exercise is to add your location in the name in Zoom, so we can have an idea on how dispersed we are in this moment, um, just to check uh, uh, how many regions of the world are connected. Um, tonight we have uh, Jonathan Smart and Miles Oglid uh, that uh, we talk about uh, the, the content, I mean, part of the content of the amazing book that they wrote uh, one year ago, I suppose, something like that. And uh, so that's all from my side. I don't want to waste uh, anyone's time. So please, John and Miles, uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, evening, evening, afternoon, morning, depending on where you are. Thanks for um, thanks for joining. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna do a, a quick overview of sooner, safer, happier. Uh, the book, some of the patterns and the anti-patterns around business agility. Uh, we're going to start with a mentee survey, find out a little bit about you and any challenges that you might be facing and any patterns, success patterns you might be experiencing. Um, first of all, introductions. So um, I'm the co-founder of Sooner Safer Happier. Uh, we help companies improve ways of working um, in order to get better outcomes and have more humane and sustainable um, world of work. Uh, prior to prior to Sooner Safer Happier, I was for a couple of years the global lead for business agility at Deloitte. Uh, prior to that, um, I was leading ways of working across Barclays Bank, um, across 80,000 people for a four year time period, um, made plenty of mistakes, learned lessons the hard way. And I've been an ad and lean practitioner since the early 1990s. So that's me, Miles. Thanks, John. Uh, yep, my name is Miles Ogilvy. I am also a co-author uh, of Sooner, Safer, Happier and co-founder of the business. Um, my career has been up through the project and program route. I spent the past 13 years before my recent consulting um, at Barclays. And for um, three of those years, I was leading on ways of working across the investment bank. Well, over to Simon Ozold. Hi, my name is Joel Berend. Um, happy to be here. Um, I'm a business agility coach, practitioner and trainer. In the past uh, 15, 16 years, I worked for a number of years together with John Myers and Simon. Um, and currently business agility coach and product owner nationwide uh, building society and co-author of Sooner Self Happy. Great. So Miles, if you wouldn't mind. Great. Hand over to you, Miles. Yeah, so before we get started, we'd like to do a quick mentee to understand where you're at. Um, if I could ask you to uh, go to the code on the screen at www.menti.com using a device and enter the code 96186381. And the first question is just an easy one, which says, who would you rather have lunch with? Just to uh, get everybody into the, into the tool so we can start to see. Um, but the, you know, everybody's there. I see one person in, well done, two people in. Two votes for Elon, fantastic. Got a few more innovators here today than we have royalists, maybe. No one for Boris. Hmm. Uh, eight people in, is there anybody else gonna join? 10 in, I'm gonna give it another a few seconds just to get through. 25, Corrado says we're on the call, so there's a few more to go.
12 of you in. Anybody else coming? Seems to be slowing down. <laughs> well done. Is there anyone having any problems getting through? Zach is, okay. Don't worry about it. My children refer to me as the anomaly in the checkout area. <laughs> Right. Um, well, you can would, you can join. It would be um, the queen. <laughs> uh, you can join it uh, if you manage to sort out the tech. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So um, I'm going to move the page on then. And the first question relates to an organisation where you are working at the moment, or where you have recently been working. If you're between engagements, and the question here is is why. And, and why change? And the first question is, in that organization, it, where you're at right now or, or recently, is there a clear articulation of why change matters? Is that, is that clearly articulated? And secondly, do colleagues broadly understand that? Are, are colleagues engaged in that conversation or is it just a very small group of people who understand that change matters? It's going to hide these so we don't need to witness. And third bullet is uh, for third question is are the outcomes of that change clear? How will things be different once the change is done? And are those outcomes being measured and made transparent? Or maybe is it more agile for agile's sake or DevOps for DevOps sake? or cloud for cloud's sake, or some other kind of digital transformation thing going on um, without the, the why being explicit. So I see seven people have answered. I'm just gonna give a minute or two for, I think there were 16 of you when I last saw. Okay, I'm gonna reveal now. Michelle, could you talk us through the answers? Yeah, thank you, Myers. I still yeah, getting some answers in. Based on the shape of the first one, it's really, really right in the middle. So half of you have the, a good experience, half of you not so much. Um, so it varies between whether the why change is articulated or not. Calling engagement on the why is, is, is worse than the previous one, especially based on the shape is more and your experience is no colleague engagement or limited calling engagement, which is, which is an anti-pattern. Clear articulation of desired business outcomes, not so much again. It's more towards again to the no articulation, no clear articulation of desired outcomes. That's again, it's not good to see, but it's quite usual. Uh, measuring those outcomes, no, we are not measuring or in your experience, not measured. Um, that's not good. Again, agile for agile's sake is not agile for agile's sake, or at least it varies, but it's more towards not for agile, agile's sake. That's, that's good to see at least. Great. Thank you. Okay, next um, screen then is around how is change being introduced in that organization? Is it in being inflicted on everybody? We will change. This is this is what the change will be. Maybe the highest paid person has decided how that how things will be different, or is is it more invitation? Is it invitation based change? Next bullet is is it one size fits all? So there's a particular particular approach being deployed. Everyone needs to follow that one approach. Uh, the next qu question is, is there an emphasis on doing Agile over exhibiting Agility, capital A Agile? And is in your context, the change being run as a project, as a transformation project with an end date? And finally, is the change being led as a, as a framework rollout or a tooling rollout, or either way, not, not being led as a, as a cultural initiative, first and foremost. 
if it's culture led, then it should be not at all score. Okay, can I reveal the answers? Jolt. Sorry, I was on mute, sorry. Um, so for the first one, it's in the model, but, but based on the shape, it's more towards the right. So it's more inflict over invite. This is uh, not good. So it's a highest paid person's opinion is in your experience is influencing what's getting done and how. One size fits all, it's, it's in the middle. So half of you have that experience that it's one size, so it's one type of framework, for example, inflicted as one size fits all, but others have better experience doing agile over exhibiting agility, again, in the middle. So transformation project with an end date, no, actually it's good to see, or, or yes, it's, uh, I mean, it varies because that is, um, yeah, both ways you have experience. Um, and scaling framework led um, is not so much, or at least is better than the other responses, 2.7 in the middle, but some of you have a really bad experience with that. Great, thank you. And next question is around what anti-patterns and patterns are you seeing? So what are the challenges that you're facing in helping that organization improve ways of working. If you've got a challenge that we call that an anti-pattern. So put AP, the letters AP at the beginning and then type something, AP colon type an anti-pattern, whatever challenges or, and what's working well, what's really helping you. What are you seeing uh, that organization is doing that's making a, a big difference. And that's, we call that a pattern. So put a P at the front of your, uh, your front of your answer. So we're seeing command and control coming up as an anti-pattern. That's very common. Heard of in our pulse check Q2, it's one of our top most um, observations is from people who responded around command and control existing in organizations. Lack of Job. psychological safety. Uh, yes, that's what we usually see. Um, so that you can't speak up, you don't feel like your there is equal contribution, equal voice, no psychological safety, silos across the organization. Definitely, we see many different silos, multiple handoffs, uh, component team silos, um, departmental silos, empowered teams as a pattern. Definitely, that's that's a desire to have uh, hierarchy minded. Again, that we see in the in the hippo type of question that it is um, happening in your context. Um, lack of collaboration. Uh, again, it's a dante pattern. Um, global approach versus local office strategy. That's that's really interesting. I've seen it. I've seen it uh, where it's not business led. It's 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 more like the local office as a different strategy than the global business customer focus strategy. That's interesting to see it comes up as an anti-pattern. I've definitely seen it and, and suffered from it. Um, creating forums for feedback. That's great. Yeah, learning organization, feedback loop established, focus on constraints. Yes, so we, we're gonna see that in uh, uh, minimal viable guardrails as an enabling um, constraint, too high uh, work in progress, so too much, too many things running in parallel. That's, that's yeah, it's a usual anti-pattern. Focus on purpose, it's a pattern. Yeah, really good, really good mix of patterns and anti-patterns. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. Thank you. Okay, John, I'm gonna pull the slides up and hand back to you. Right, thank you. Um, just a reflection on that. Really interesting to see quite a lot of cultural, as usual, seeing quite a lot of cultural anti-patterns in there. Uh, there, I, there was one around hippo, highest paid person's opinion. Um, there was one around lack of knowledge and experience. 
is leading to a lack of, I can't remember the exact wording, but a lack of sponsorship or pull from leaders. Um, so interesting and and totally normal to see the mixture of kind of cultural and more processy type things in the patterns and the anti-patterns there. Um, so, so I'm going to run through now, we're going to do a very quick run through of the, the top eight patterns and anti-patterns, um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. So Miles, if you could move the slide deck on, please. Um, patterns and anti-pattern language, um, there, there is no such thing as best practice. Organizations are unique, your context is unique. What works for one company or, or is optimal for one company is not going to be optimal for another company. Um, that's why I prefer the language like the language patterns and anti-patterns, because it's not about best practice. Um, in my experience, patterns are more likely to give you a tailwind and anti-patterns are more likely to give you a headwind. Um, it's still possible to be successful with anti-patterns, but it's probably going to make a hard job harder. And patterns will probably make a hard job slightly less hard. Um, obviously, you have to apply it in context based on your own culture, history, um, and a whole bunch of other contextual criteria. Um, but I still think there are, but that said, based on our own experience and looking across over 100 organizations, there are some repeating patterns and anti-patterns. So first one is focus on the outcomes. Um, we made this mistake previously. We were running an agile transformation. We were, we were using the word agile transformation. I was the head of the agile transformation. Effectively, my one pager when I went and met with leadership teams was, hi, my name is John, and I'm here to make you do agile whether you like it or not. Um, sponsored by the executive committee. Uh, the executive committee is saying, yeah, you have to do agile. As you can imagine, some people love that. Some people didn't love it quite so much. Um, and it's focusing on the wrong thing. We were measuring the wrong things. We were measuring uh, how many agile teams we have. We were measuring cargo cult type behavior. Um, are you doing stand-ups? Do you have product owners? And at the end of year one, perhaps not surprisingly, we hadn't seen the movement that we might have expected to have seen in the actual outcomes. So we pivoted. Um, another case study here is Nokia, Symbian, Symbian operating system, uh, the dev team were doing large scale scrum. They were doing scrum very well, but it didn't save Symbian. And according to the chairman of Nokia in his book, Transforming Nokia, it was a lack of psychological safety, which led to uh, the major determinant leading to the demise of Symbian. Bad news was not being bubbled up. So we pivoted and since then have worked with um, a number of organizations across industry sectors, and public and private and we have found these outcomes to to work uh, across contexts um, and they balance each other so the first one is better better is quality and it is baking quality in um, rather than inspecting it in later the second one is value value is unique it's why you're in business it's i find it's good to measure value through okrs objectives and key results the key results are your leading and lagging measures of value, entirely unique to your organization. The next one is sooner. Sooner is the heart of agile and lean. It's around time to value, time to flow. Um, for example, lead time, concept to cash, time to learning, throughput, account of items of value, and flow efficiency, the amount of time that work is being worked on versus the overall lead time. Uh, flow efficiency, typically, most large organizations is as low as 10%. Um, and that means work is waiting 90% of the time. The next one is safer, and safer is compliance. So this is things like data privacy, cyber, information security, uh, risk, compliance, and so on. And this is about discipline. This is agile, not fragile, and uh, continuous compliance. Um, and and perhaps not surprisingly, we have found this way of working to be much safer. And then finally, there's happier. And this is happier customers, colleagues, citizens, and climate, because improving ways of working is not at any cost to the planet or the society. And what we found is these outcomes balance each other nicely because you can't force lead time reduction. If you force a quicker time to, time to learning, 
um, and that's done through working people harder rather than helping improve the system of work, you'll end up with lower quality and you'll end up with unhappier colleagues. And this is exactly what the State of DevOps report showed. Um, in terms of the size of the prize, the, the types of benefits that we've seen for quality after three and a half years across tens of thousands of people, we saw a 20 times reduction in failure demand. On Sooner, we saw a three times improvement on average uh, in terms of time to value and time to learning. The best teams were 20 times quicker, and that means 20 times less sunk cost fallacy, quicker to pivot, uh, increased agility, cheapest cost of failure. In terms of safer, we saw an improved compliance trend. Um, we saw less things going wrong, and when things did go wrong, it was a whimper rather than the bang because it was more smaller change. And anecdotally, people in the role in those specialist roles like InfoSec, information security, the feedback was that they were spending less of their time firefighting and more of their time proactively with the product teams. And then happier, we saw the highest ever colleague engagement scores, and that was from an external third party UView survey and a positive client net promoter score. So that's some of the benefits that we've seen. Um, Noting that that was after three and a half years across tens of thousands of people. You know, this is not a magic switch that happens overnight. This is measured in years rather than months or, or weeks. Uh, the next um, pattern anti pattern pair is achieve big through small. Think big, start small, learn fast. The, the anti pattern is achieve big through big. Um, instead, apply an agile mindset to agility. Um, start small run small experiments, have an S-curve approach to change, keep the gradient to change low to start with. You've got the most amount of impediments, the most amount of unlearning needs to be done in the organization. So you need to start small, nail it before you scale it, generate social proof, communicate a lot, um, recognition, reward, incentivization, um, and then you can start to increase the gradient to change. Now, we, we made a mistake on this, uh, back in the past, we tried to do too much too soon. We had a, a, a target from the from the Exco, and what we saw is we saw new labels on the same old behaviour. Not surprisingly, people were doing stand ups. People were called product owners and scrum masters, but in reality, it was the same old behaviour. I did a floor walk. I met. I spoke to a bunch of teams, and they said we've done three iterations of analysis, and then we'll do three iterations of development, and then we'll do four iterations of testing. What happens when we have a bug? Um, you know, charitable intent, people are, people are trying their best. Um, the next one, the next pattern anti-pattern pair is invite over inflict. So the anti-pattern here is to inflict change upon people. And we have seen that happen a number of times where we've seen the infliction of ways of working on people. We've seen not surprisingly, um, a lack of buy-in, a lack of feeling of agency, uh, um, an agentic state, which is I'm not going to take ownership of these outcomes. I'm being mandated to do this. I don't want to do it. I'm quite happy with my current ways of working. I just need to pay the mortgage. Um, this is more than my job's worth. So instead, start with invitation, start with the natural champions, start with the people who are, hell yes, um, thank goodness at last we can we have support to be able to improve our ways of working. And maybe maybe people have worked like this at another company or in this company. Um, so get behind your champions. A great way to identify champions is a community of practice, a voluntary COP community of practice. Um, uh, you know, run a COP, see who turns up every single time. Very quickly, you can, you can identify the champions and also just invite participation. You know, who wants to go first? And importantly, one size does not fit all. Um, it's not about um, inflicting uh, uh, one, one pattern or methodology or framework across everybody because organizations are not homogenous. Um, there are a million different contexts within every, every large organization. So it's getting that right balance between teams choosing their own ways of working and using their own brains to improve with minimal viable guardrails. There are some things that are not negotiable in terms of control and safety. Uh, number four is leadership behavior will make it or break. And this is around the role of leadership. Uh, pretty much every survey on business agility in organizations 
the number one impediment that comes back in the survey is a lack of leadership support. Pretty much always number one. Um, and so this is where, and this is not them as leaders pointing up. This is everybody as a leader. I firmly believe in leaders at all levels. You might have just come out of school or college or university. You might just have joined the company. You are able to be just as much a leader as anyone else. Um, maybe not quite as big a sphere of control, but still you can grow your sphere of influence. Uh, Greta Thunberg is a great example of someone who's a great leader and was at school. So um, leaders, leaders at all levels, it requires role modeling, psychological safety and servant leadership. Um, the anti-pattern is not role modeling, uh, which is sitting around the table with your arms crossed saying, go on, transform. Uh, the anti-pattern to psychological safety is a culture of fear. Do this or else. I've seen one leader do this at an organization. People did exactly what they were told to do and nothing more. They wouldn't improve. They wouldn't use their own brains. They didn't dare try anything until they were told exactly what to do. Uh, a culture of learned helplessness. And then servant leadership, which is supporting lines rather than reporting lines. Dear team, I'm here to help you. How can I help remove impediments from out of your way? So I find that leadership coaching is important. Number five is build the right thing. This is product over project. So this is the pivot from temporary projects, people coming together in a team, building a project, disbanding, forming, storming, norming, and then maybe getting to performing and then disbanding. Instead, it's long-lived teams on long-lived products. And it's outcomes over milestones. And this is where OKRs I find to be a, a good tool, a good mechanism, very clear objective and very clear key results. So you know how you're doing. Pattern six is build the thing right. So this is governance, risk and compliance. And it's um, enabling fast speed with control rather than the anti-pattern, which is speed or control. So we see uh, many folk who um, are just unable to accelerate because of the congested risk and control approach. The organization can be extremely siloed and all of the handoffs involved in gaining effective uh, risk guidance can really slow teams down. So some of the patterns here are around um, pivoting to cross-functional long-lived safety teams that are a risk and control equivalent to a value stream and to put in place a minimum viable contact sensitive compliance process as opposed to the very large tick lists where however small the change, um, you have to go through all the steps. We, we ran an experiment with a hello world application, uh, two lines of code and times the amount of time it took from uh, code complete to, to production live, putting it through the standard control gates of an organization that took three months and 20 man days of project management efforts to facilitate and because of all of the one size fits all controls that existed. So context sensitive guardrails and cross-functional long-lived safety teams are two key patterns to help build the thing right and get speed and control. In terms of continuous attention to technical excellence, um, this is um, going slower to go faster. So the key pattern here is slowing down, spending the time, investing the time in technical excellence so that you are architecting for speed. Those non-functional requirements, which your um, often business colleagues may be unaware of, may not understand and may not prioritize are super important to help you go faster. So helping educate your organization around the need for continual attention to excellence uh, is, is one of the key patterns here. John, are there any other patterns you'd like to draw attention to in this one? This is normally Simon's chapter. I think, well, there's the, um, the agile hollow shell, just to add that one, which is where teams are doing scrum, but none of the technical excellence practices. And it's not, and also it's not just technical excellence, it's also process excellence and culture excellence as well. So just basically becoming a feature factory, churning out widgets off the end of the assembly line, probably just measuring velocity. Thank you. And then Charles. 
Thank you. Thank you, Myers. So this is this is about learning organization. This is about optimizing for learnings and enabling learning uh, at the organization at each level, um, individual team, team of team level, um, organizational level. Um, also, it's about um, discover, it's about discoverability of where the knowledge is. Um, knowledge and information bubbles are quite usual in organizations. And this is about how do we pivot from those disconnected learning and information bubbles to more connectedness across the organization to enable sharing, co-creation and sharing information across the different silos within the organization. It's also about um, measurements and measure for learning, pivoting from weaponized metrics where the focusing focuses on targets, um, achieving a target uh, rather than maximizing outcomes and learning. And so how do we pivot measure for learning and measuring a better value sooner, safer, happier outcomes? Thank you, Thank Patrick. You. Great, thank you. So in terms of why we wrote this book, um, we wanted to share lessons learned the hard way. We've made mistakes so that you don't have to, plus other companies. Uh, we want to help create more humane ways of working. Traditional ways of working are kind of feast to famine. And we believe in business agility over doing agile, not surprisingly. Um, and that's whole company agility, not just agile in IT. The audience for the book is leaders, leaders at all levels in all roles those helping and those hindering. Um, so this is, it's deliberately aimed for quite a broad audience. Um, and there's kind of some more, for those newer to the topic, there's some more introductory type material at the front. And um, in terms of the climate part of Happier, um, out of the author royalties, we are planting a tree for every four books which are sold, which is a 10 times carbon benefit. Um, by, by a charity called Tree Sisters who um, plant trees and support women in countries where there is less equality for women. Um, and we have a community. So if you go to soonersaferhappier.com to scroll down a bit, you can sign up and you can get added to a Slack channel. Um, how many people do we have on there roughly, Miles? There's around... Uh... 1,000 people signed up so far, and around 500 people in the Slack channel. Yeah, great. So, yeah, if you if you want to sign up for that, there's, you know, you can post questions um, and uh, uh, talk about any challenges you're having around business agility, and there's a good community there to, to jump in and um, help answer some of your questions. So, so that was the, that's the quick run through. Um, Thank you for uh, thank you for your attention and for listening, and um, happy to take Q and A. Yeah, thank you, John, Miles, and Zoltan. Um, any any question? Uh, and in the chat, actually, there was not a question. There was probably what I think is a comment from Bob about the organization and psychotherapy, but I don't know if this is a question or not. In in the option. Oh, yeah, one second. Any any question from the audience? While I'm trying to increase my volume. Interested to hear from people in terms of, you know, what's what's going well, what's working for you, what what challenges are you facing? I see a question from Zach. Yeah, Jordan. Zach, please unmute to make your question. I beg your pardon. Make make your question. Ask your question. Oh, right. Um, I was wondering which techniques you use to measure psychological safety. Psychological safety or uh, the, the risk and control side of safety? It's, it's for the psychological side of it you're interested in. So. Um, yeah, I use a technique called um, ECFAL's Creative Climate. Uh, do you okay. use that at all? <laughs> haven't come across that myself, no. Oh, it's fantastic. There's hundreds of companies using it. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I tend to regard Amy Edmondson as the go-to source on this topic. She has a survey of psychological safety, which is 
quite helpful for at least the team level to drive conversations and allow you to put, start to put some sort of quantification around it. Yeah, what I've found with that, uh, the main drawback is that people have to register. Whereas, and, and what that does is it makes them not answer as honestly as they might do. So if you've got a way of measuring that is anonymous at team level, you can then start to um, Indeed. get the teams to come up with their own ways of improving their local climate, their Indeed. own culture. And then from that, you can very quickly put through lean scenes if you've come across them. So you're familiar with a user story. Yeah. So a lean scene is the business equivalent and it looks at the problem from different perspectives, i.e. the team, the manager, and the C-suite. So that's where guys like yourselves and coaches come in to be able to get the conversation, the collaboration going through the business. And from that, you can create a business case, which has got a very minimal um, compliance set of tools that you can use. Sounds good. Um, Zach, could you put in the chat the, the tool that you use for psychological safety? Yeah, sure. It's um, on my main website. Uh, I don't suppose. In the, in the chat, that'd be interesting. Um, yeah, as, as, Miles, as Miles said, so we normally run... Um, yeah, with inspiration from Amy, we're normally running anonymous surveys, um, both at the team level and, and with leadership teams. And it's interesting to compare the two and hold the mirror up to leadership teams where they rate themselves much more highly than, than their teams. Yes, yes. Um, and self-reporting is one of the big, big burdens there. So it's yeah. quite funny to see the differences between um, directors and people doing the work you'll get some teams yeah. that are aligned with the directors and some that are not but uh, and then i think it's what's really useful is the conversation that it triggers you know it's if if leaders if the if the self perception is oh it's this is we're such a psychologically safe but their teams are like rating them incredibly low uh, it, it's the conversation that's the useful oh, indeed and yeah. um, uh, we tend to use a, a disney metaphor there where if you watch a disney movie in family the pre-teens laugh at one bit, the teens laugh at the bit where there's a coming of age, and the parents laugh but have a hint of nostalgia about it. And when yeah. you map that across to business, the way that people see themselves as teens, as pre-teens, middle managers as the teens, and the C-suite as the, the parents, uh, you can get the conversation flowing a lot better. I find that it does bring that leadership from above tie-in yeah. look at what what leaders are interested in they don't care if it's agile devops or whatever it is running underneath it's yeah. how do you do it so but it's, it's fascinating yeah. stuff yeah thank you zach and um, there is one more question from alina please, please alina. See, uh, Rud rudiger Rud rudiger's got a question as well ah sorry yes oh sorry sorry rudiger can you unmute to make your question? How's that? There we go. Can yeah. you hear me all right? Yes, yes, please. So um, I've taken a bit of a shine to, I suppose, uh, approaches that incorporate uh, sort of TOC, theory constraints. Um, I find often in sort of agile teams, there's often a lot of activity going on but uh, the sort of the mental models of TOC help me focus that energy and activity on those areas that make the most difference. Is that something that you use in your approaches or incorporate in your approaches? 100%, absolutely, yeah. I don't know, Joel, if you wanna comment anything on that, on theory of constraints. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I was on mute again. So yes, thank you. This is definitely a brilliant question. And uh, 
part of our um, approach in terms of um, you know, looking at um, the end-to-end, -end, first of all, looking at visibility and creating end-to-end -end flow and uh, unlocking measurability around end-to-end -end flow, and then identifying impediments to the flow, and then identifying what is the biggest impediment which we could, we could tackle first and overcome, and again, see what the impact is, and uh, do, do it at organization, it's a quite, a useful practice with with all um, with organizations yes and I, I found it to work really well with some senior leaders as well just just the expression impediments are not in the path impediments are the path mm -hmm. i found that saying to land quite well with people and some light bulbs go off for more traditionally minded leaders where it's like oh yeah it's about it going from impediment to impediment to impediment, ideally the biggest impediment. Um, and part of the narrative there is like, if it's not the weakest link in the chain, maybe stop strengthening it and move, move to now where the biggest blocker is to flow, which often is upstream. It's, you know, you can keep on improving DevOps or you like downstream, but actually the biggest blocker is the PMO or the, you know, the steering committee sign off process upstream. So, um, yeah, I, I do find that to be a very useful mindset. Um, I found that the um, uh, TameFlow has got a very interesting approach to understanding where the constraints are by looking at um, average flow time. Mm -hmm. And that is a, a really simple but very, very useful way of identifying where the constraint is. And, 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 and usually the issue is that when you ask that, okay, what's your, what's your average flow time? What's your flow efficiency? What's the average, what's the median or whatever statistical average you wanna use? The problem is they can't measure it because mm. there is no connection end to end. So it's, that's, that's, it's, it's, it's a big thing around unlocking measurability, which also includes a lot of behavior pattern change. Once you have that connection end to end, then you can start measuring and you can create that visibility of where are the work, where is the queue, where are, where are the different idle times, wait times, and you can start measuring a lot of good things, which is eye opening and drive lots of good conversations. Mm. Measuring is non trivial. Great. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing. Yeah. Thank you, Rodrigo, for the question. And now, Alina, if you can unmute, uh, please. Hi, everyone. I'm interested to find out what is your opinion about SAFE. I'm just transitioning from an organization which was, it is on their way of adopting SAFE. Um, and I've been hearing different opinions about it and I've never worked in an organization that actually has implemented it previously. And I'm curious to see what you think about it. I love this question. Thank you, Alina. Uh, so my personal view is hashtag all frameworks, not hashtag no frameworks or hashtag one framework. So use what works in context. Now, my view is applying the scaled agile framework across an entire organization where that organization has more than one product and is more than about 100 people is, a, is an anti-pattern because that's a one size fits all type approach. So the Scaled Agile framework evolved in a particular context. And that particular context was A, software development, B, 100 plus people kind of scaling vertically, not scaling horizontally, but kind of building big software solutions in a kind of vertical scale manner, where it's one product with a, with a high level of architectural coupling and a low level of agility in the company. It enables a command and control mindset to continue unchecked. So actually for, for, um, for leaders in companies, it's actually relatively culturally quite easy to adopt because there's still the word commitment and you know normalized story points and synchronized iterations and all of this. Um, in the context of building a satellite, it's probably a good pattern. And in fact, Dean Leffingwell quotes satellite building as, it, as an example for the use of SAFE. Um, I, so I don't have any 
issues at all with with safe as a pattern it's a great pattern when you have that context however most companies most large companies one percent of all of the contexts is probably that context where you need to have people marching on a, this exactly the identical cadence with normalized story points and bringing together in a vertical scale manner bringing together lots of solutions all at the same time um so the anti-pattern is applying it across an entire company because you know what single piece flow kanban might suit these two people over here doing something really rapid um scrum might suit another team um large scale scrum might whatever might suit another team in one company because of a historical baggage around the word agile it was actually smaller waterfalls that got them to better value sooner safer happier it was like 12 month waterfall six month waterfall three month waterfall one month waterfall oh we, we seem to have embraced agility um without using the a word um so that's my view alina Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, one more question from De Perso. Is it correct? De Perso? Okay. Okay, well, uh, the, the question, because I cannot see. I can the question see, is. I can see De Perso is on. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. There we go. Okay. Hi, yeah, sorry, the question was, um, I forgot what I typed. Oh, uh, any success developing and leveraging agile co coaching frameworks and your transformations? And the, the background of this was, I don't know if Zolt remembers me, but I actually worked at Deloitte and we both parted and went our separate ways, but we were working in that kind of global group across Asia, Australia, the Americas to develop like what an internal coaching development framework looks like at Deloitte. And then we both departed. So Zolt, if you remember me and Ed Marshall. <laughs> um, so I was just kind of curious if maybe you guys had carried that over into, into your work or if that ever went anywhere at Deloitte because I think it had a lot of promise. And at my current company, um, I've actually been feeding them some, you know, some of the same things like the patterns and anti-patterns you guys talked about and then how that fits into, you know, training and developing coaches and stuff. So just kind of, I know it's a loaded question, but I was just kind of curious. <laughs> yeah, great, great, great question. Um, so from my perspective, and then Joel, if you want to jump in, jump in. Um, so my, so obviously I, you know, I've, uh, I was at Deloitte and I'm, you know, now we're running Sooner Safer Happier. I'm no longer at Deloitte. So I'm not, I know it, I know it carried on a life. Um, I think, you know, you mentioned someone called Ed Marshall. I think Ed, Ed and Denise were doing a great job on it, is my understanding. Um, in terms of building out a kind of, you know, how do we build the build proficiency of people around agile coaching in an experiential manner? Um, so the, the, the honest answer to your question is beyond that, I haven't really developed or leveraged a particular agile coaching framework. No. Um, uh, so we, our part of, part of how we are working with companies is we are, very much specialized on with people specializing with people who already have that experience um as opposed to kind of growing new coaches um so so not a lot to add on to the the end of the, that deloitte story um i don't know jolt if you have anything you want to add no really similar experience i just want to add that you know it's no i think it's no difference so it's so important to learn in the learning organization that you have you know the training and 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 the and the upskilling and uh, from many different ways. If it's if it's captured in a structural way, that I think it's it's a good approach, especially if the organization is starting something. Um, what what I see is, for example, communities of practices can 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 take that role in terms of uh, you know upskilling and co-sharing and co-creating something. Uh, around, for example, coaching, or for example, being a, a scrum master community or product owner, those type of communities I see in my current organization. Um, that's that's really helpful. Um, yeah, so it's 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 training, and if it's a bit more structured at the beginning, I think it helps. Maybe just to add one other thought: there's a a large global company that I'm working with at the moment 
and I like what they've done because they've, they've actually created a bit of a career framework around being a ways of working coach internally. And I think that's quite nice that they've actually created like a career path. So if that's the career path you want to take internally as a ways of working coach, then you can, you know, and you've got, you've got support and, you know, training and everything else as an internal colleague in this company. And this is not a consultant, a consulting company. This is a, it happens to be an energy company. Um, I quite like the fact they've created that career pathway. Yeah, they're they're, they're developing a, a career pathway at my my current company, and as the probably the only like IC, IC Agile certified person in the firm, they're already asking me if I want to switch over. But it's just I was curious because I I found that like with the lack of any sort of like centralized learning model or something, where I've had the most success is like you guys were mentioning, sort of finding the people who are passionate about it, and you can kind of be those evangelists and those change agents, but I really like, you know, coaching from a consulting perspective, right? They bring you in and kind of with like the golden bullet <laughs> array. But in my experience so far, you know, eight months into a new, you know, the world's largest asset manager, it's, I'm just able to find and mentor people that, you know, just sort of tutoring them on the agile mindset. It really doesn't matter if you're a coach, a scrum master, or whatever, just sort of the, the basics of agility and some of the flow metrics and, you know, I obviously refer back to better value, sooner, safer, happier, since we were coaching on a lot of that in the Deloitte days anyways. Um, but just it really doesn't matter what their role is. If you can kind of get them to understand the basics and the importance of being able to pivot, accelerate, you know, go back, those sort of things like people can, you know, become de facto coaches, if you will, whether they're an analyst, a product manager, owner. So it's just kind of curious, right? I don't know. I don't think there always needs to be that sort of centralized path, but if you have enough people with the knowledge and are willing to sort of extend that out, you know, you can sort of get a grassroots, but it is super helpful when those are those established training paths and careers that people can latch on to, especially those who are passionate about it. So um, yeah, I'm just kind of curious. <laughs> yeah. And, and Derek, um, I've noticed in the chat, congratulations, you're the lucky winner of the Happier, as soon as I happier. Oh, awesome! Yeah, it must have been the only person that actually entered the code. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. It was a randomization that we put in. Oh, awesome! Well, yeah, I just downloaded the first three chapters, so I'll look forward to receiving the entire book and reading it. <laughs> Great. So, Great. Might Shop make your day. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. I think we have time for just one more question before closing. Is there anyone who wants to make a question? Simply unmute and make your question if you want. No, any final comment? Um, I can share just uh, to, to add uh, some uh, information. I will share the results of the Tag Cloud uh, that we made uh, at the beginning. Let me check one second. Okay, just uh, for your information, this is the, the tag cloud with uh, the agile mindset attributes that actually we have done at the beginning, just for your information. You can see collaboration, respect and flexibility are emerging. Lovely. Thank you for uh, responding to that. I have one question if we still have time. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure, Derek, there... now you're, it's, it's your day, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been any recently with any clients, like any novel patterns or anti-patterns? I know obviously a whole lot of experience bringing together the book and the company and everything, but has there been anything that's been like, huh, a head scratcher, like I've never seen that before, or that's a new curveball I've never experienced or anything like that? Or is it still kind of noticing the same things regardless of industry, company size, et cetera? That's a really good question. Um, I'll go first and then Miles and Joel, please do jump in. Um, that's a great question. I, 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 I keep a learning log. So I try, I keep a track, you know, I keep it all oh, like light bulb moment. I'll, I'll make a, make a note of it. Nearly all of the time it's, re, it's the same repeating patterns. It's, you know, it's the, usually the same kind of, same kind of, uh, patterns and anti-patterns. One thing that stands out, one of the immediate thing that springs to my mind when you ask that question, Derek, is an organization that's doing a really good job. So this is a, 
you know, multiple hundred year old organization and the executive committee are fully bought in. So it's, it's from the top of the house, which is, is, is absolutely the recipe for success. So you've got the right narrative, you've got the right support and they are embracing OKRs, objectives and key results. And they're doing that to really shift the focus to outcomes rather than output. And so I think just the thing that springs to my mind when you ask that, ask that question, I have never seen a company, this is the first time I've seen a company kind of do it this well, and I, well in quotes, I don't, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. I don't mean that they're going to write the OKRs well, because they won't, they'll be written badly. But I mean more the meta level of just, I have a huge amount of respect for the courage the vulnerability, the willingness to jump in with two feet, you know, defined exco level, top strategic OKRs, uh, OKR alignment with the divisions. And then we, we're going to get to the narrow and deep where we start to run small experiments. Having done the broad and shallow, we can then do the narrow and deep experiments. Start small, think big, start small. So that's what springs to my mind, you know, kudos, respect to this company, for jumping in with two feet. Um, I'll just I'll just contribute something um, relatively small, but you know you keep your eyes open all the time and sort of pick up think oh that's interesting and little observations about life. Um, I've noticed how when um, when we are providing a presentation to a leadership team to a C-suite team um, and. Um, you're obviously, you know, there's the message there around um, finding finding the innovators to um, to start small with. So, who's your population that you're going to start small with? Um, the, the eager, interested population. One of the things that can happen when you talk to a leadership team is you discover who's who's really interested. So, the people that are even before you get in the room. Um, knocking on your door saying is could I have some coaching I, I hear you're going to come and talk to us they're, they're the people who you'll be starting with <laughs> and so the at every level this 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 ability to identify your innovators and early adopters is so helpful and it, it, you know people will come and and self-identify to you and that's where in your in that context you'll find yourself working in your organization just an observation from recently. And uh, I would just share my recent positive experience of how invitation over inflict is uh, a really, really good pattern. So building a ways of working dashboard and using uh, more like a startup approach uh, with the right leadership, giving a go ahead to do a startup approach. So having early, you know, your early adopters, innovators emerging and um, establishing the feedback, feedback loop preventing from you know, having just a couple of people using a couple of services to now more than 1,000 people um, looking at a self-serve dashboard, taking data and, and um, uh, using it for measure for learning. So that's, that's a really positive experience for me and reinforcing. So that's been captured through surveys. So that's been uh, captured just through the visits to the dashboard and also how people are sharing what they have done in terms of, so this is a ways of working dashboard measuring flow, uh, flow efficiency we talked about or quality or safer. So all, all those dimensions we mentioned at the beginning and uh, this is self-serve automated, automatically refreshed to accessible to all colleagues at all levels, so. Got it. This is awesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, yeah. We have a um, we have a YouTube video actually on that. Just just sharing all those experiences, all those patterns with this organization. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, Zod, for for sharing this. And uh, well, I think we have done. I want to say thank you to our three speakers. It was a very interesting event. I think. It was interesting because there are a lot of actual actions that you can start doing in your uh, your office, actually. So really, really thanks for, uh, for sharing. Thanks uh, for uh, 
the references of the book uh, and for the sticker who take uh, who took the registration for that and see you next time in one month or something like that and i put in the chat uh, some links uh, for uh, for our community resources so you are invited to to join that and uh, again thank you for the event thank you very much have a good Thank day. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Enjoy the evening. Bye-bye.